Walter Slocum is Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and since 1993 has been an ex-officio member of the U.S. Institute of Peace Board of Directors. For over seven years, Walt has been in a key position nonstop at the Defense Department and a pivotal actor in the shaping of U.S. policy in the Balkans. He's going to look at the lessons learned from the security engagement in the Balkans during the past eight years and consider what re remains to be done to bring about a durable peace. Welcome, Walt. Thanks. Uh, for uh, three more days, I still have to say that what I have to say does not rec necessarily reflect the views of the administration. After that, there will be no question. <laughs> um, first of all, I think uh, the, the points that Morta Bramowitz have made about the extraordinary improvements in the situation compared to eight years ago uh, are, are, are true. Uh, in, each, in each of the, of the areas in Bosnia, uh, in Kosovo, and of course most fundamentally the changes in, in Serbia uh, which have opened the prospect for a, a, a solution reached by political means and by some kind of accommodation and patience as opposed to, to violence. Uh, there's certainly still areas of, of potential trouble uh, in the most immediate sense, uh, probably in the press of a valley, but more broadly there's lots of unfinished business and as uh, Mort says, the most fundamental issue is the re defining the relationship between Serbia and Kosovo. I if I understood correctly, having established the dichotomy of two basic approaches, one broadly autonomy and the other broadly independence, he wisely counsels that there are, there are sufficient disadvantages to each that insofar as the, the stark choice, and it is I think the fundamentally a stark choice, but can be deferred while Serbia consolidates its democracy and Kosovo establishes institutions, which is a process which may in some ways make both results uh, less, may make the choice less stark, is certainly important. It's worth making the point that one important piece of unfinished business, which uh, Mort referred to at least indirectly, is that of which in, in Pentagon jargon is called PIFWICs. The Pentagon doesn't deal with war criminals, we deal with persons indicted for war crimes. <laughs> Fifth uh, it, it is important to bear in mind that of all of the uh, unsealed indictments, and there are presumably some, still some sealed ones, of all the people who have been indicted, uh, more than two-thirds of the cases have been disposed of one way or another, in some case by the departure of these people from this life, uh, but in most cases by either uh, their, their voluntary surrender, and, and in addition to uh, Madam Plavsic, there have been a significant number of voluntary surrenders, or by their capture, there have been now something like 20 uh, Pifwicks uh, detained uh, in, in Bosnia or in uh, Croatia and, and uh, rendered to The Hague. Uh, the big fish, at least the very biggest fish, remain at large. And, and ending that situation will continue to be an issue. There are lots of reasons uh, for the favorable developments. Uh, some are largely indigenous. My personal belief has been, has always been that one of the things which made the biggest contribution uh, to the end of the fighting in Bosnia was the success of the, the Croatians in, in first rather brutally expelling Serbs who had lived for hundreds of years in the Kraina and then sweeping into Bosnia, an effect which both obviously weakened the Serb resistance, demoralized the Bosnian Serbs because it became clear that Milosevic was not going to save them, but perhaps equally important, raised in the minds of the Bosnian government in Sarajevo some serious questions about whether they really wanted to be liberated by the Croatians and thereby created a context on all sides uh, for, for a more compromised approach. Some are clearly the result of U.S. efforts. 
uh, in particular in the case of Bosnia, the, the pressure in 1994 and 1995 for a gradually stiffening NATO stance. There are a lot of, of interesting what ifs. What if uh, in the, at the very beginning the United States had joined UNPROFOR or otherwise uh, had been more involved? What if at the beginning of this administration uh, the United States had been able to agree on a course of action with its allies earlier? But what if the United Nations had taken a different and more robust stand in Bosnia, not so much in not being neutral as between the parties, but in not being neutral as between people who were shooting at unperformed people who weren't? Uh, what if the United States and, and NATO had been clearer, or at least more convincing, about what they would do if uh, Milosevic in fact resumed ethnic cleansing in, in Kosovo? What if the Congress had imposed fewer uh, de facto, if not de jure, limits and given more support and been less inclined either on the one hand to, to uh, dismiss the whole problem or on the other to uh, espouse attractive but unrealistic uh, solutions? Uh, and, and in this context, I think it's, it's important, particularly given uh, the particular place in the political calendar we find ourselves, to pay tribute to Republicans like Senator Warner, uh, Senator McCain, uh, Senator Dole, and, and presidential candidate and former presidential candidate Dole, and uh, Governor Bush, who supported President Clinton at key points on key decisions uh, much as they may have disagreed and obviously disagreed with his general policies, but also disagreed with some details, some important details of his Balkan policies, but were prepared, I think, to accept that the United States had a vital interest in, in success and provided important support. But I am much happier dealing with or contemplating these what-ifs and the continuing problems, which were outlined, which are very real, compared with a symposium on the situation in the Balkans if the United States had not, in fact, been as active and engaged as it was uh, both in, in Bosnia and Kosovo. There are some lessons. I think the most important lesson is that it is still true today that security in remote places with less than angelic players uh, can affect a very vital, very important United States interest. The, the situation in the Balkans in both uh, Bosnia and Kosovo had important humanitarian elements and undoubtedly the humanitarian elements were very important in the public perception. But fundamentally the issue was not simply humanitarian, it was security and stability in Europe which is an important American interest as well as a European interest. The second is, is the obvious platitude that the United States at least in an area like this, the United States has to expect that if, if its interests are to be defended and vindicated, we are going to have to lead, and that requires clarity and a certain degree of unity. Uh, but it is equally true, and what makes in some sense doing that more complicated in, in the European region as elsewhere, that the United States cannot realistically act alone which means not only kind of skillful spin control and diplomacy, but in extremists actually taking account of other people's opinions and interests, uh, even if we don't entirely share them. Uh, and in this context, I think in particular, uh, the role of Russia is in, the, in the future of the Balkans is important. Uh, there's certainly no... Uh, the, the experience shows that difficult as it can be, there, it is not in our interest to try to exclude Russia from the Balkan problem, unless, of course, they adopt, they were to adopt policies which are self-excluding or so contrary uh, to the promotion of a solution that they've excluded themselves. But I think the point about taking account of others' interests applies to Russia uh, just as much, although obviously in different, to different degrees, as it applies to, to allies. It's also clear the military cannot act alone. Uh, the biggest problems after eight years of experience at this are about mobilizing other instruments of national and in international policy. 
diplomacy, po po political pressures, intelligence assets and instruments, economic measures, coordinating the work of NGOs and international organizations, the special and, and immensely frustrating problem of, of, of uh, international support for police, whether it's training local police, creating decent local police forces, or sending in international uh, police forces. Um, and as a matter of national policy, we have regrettably and foolishly uh, starved these non-military instruments of policy relative even to the, to, the, to the problems we have in maintaining a military capacity. And indeed, it is often the case that, that the, the use of force uh, will depend on showing that other instruments have, have been tried and have not been successful. And that obviously uh, focuses on the need to use these instruments. And uh, also, another lesson is that, that you cannot divorce these regional problems, although they have broad international implications, from their cultural and historical roots. That is not to say that conflict is inevitable, any more inevitable in the Balkans than it is anywhere else in the world, but that there are real tensions and real problems and that resolution takes takes understanding and also uh, living with the fact that there are no angels in this play, although there are a few devils. Um, there's a lot of discussion about reduction of the U.S. commitment and it, there's no question that over time those reductions uh, are appropriate and should take place. There have been substantial reductions already. But I, and this I guess is one where I should emphasize I speak for myself, I don't think the United States should shrink from the proposition that for a long time into the future, uh, not necessarily forever, but for a long time into the future, U.S. security interests in Europe will require the presence of some NATO military capability in the Balkans, and I think for a variety of reasons, good, bad, and indifferent, that implies the presence of some American military presence in the Balkans. A lot can be shifted. The total level can continue to be reduced as it has been. A lot can be shifted. A lot of the burden can be shifted uh, to non-military instruments. But I think it would be a mistake to set up as an objective that the United States as opposed, should get out militarily altogether as opposed to looking to the day when uh, there won't need to be any or at least any significant NATO military presence. And finally, and, and coming particularly from the perspective of the Department of Defense, the, the Bosnia-Kosovo Balkan experience underscores that military force is essential as a potential instrument in dealing with truly intractable brutal and deep-seated conflicts like these, both as a threat and as an ultimate instrument of policy. Just a few observations about some of the lessons about the use of military force in conflicts like this. The first, and, and I think the most important, and a lesson which is easier to state than to <coughs> apply in, in practice, is that there are no magic bullets. Uh, there, are, there are no particular sets of, of buttons which, if appropriately bombed over the course of a day or so, will produce instant dramatic results. Sometimes they may, but you can't count on it and you, and you should not start on a, on a military on the use of force in this or any other regional context unless you are prepared to stay the course. In connection with that, it is clearly disadvantageous from a lot of perspectives to rule out options and therefore I think the lesson is don't rule out options but you have to face the problem that if you announce that all options are open you may at the at the outset and, and mean it in any serious sense you may create problems uh, domestically and with allies uh, which uh, which are, are, are intractable and prevent you from dealing with the problem at all and in the military as much as with the political, you have to recognize that a coalition campaign is going to involve allies. That has implications about capabilities in which the allies need to improve theirs relative to ours, but it also has implication for decision making and that, that to some degree shared burdens imply shared decision making. In this kind of intervention, although I believe they, they have at stake 
important national interests do not have national survival at, at stake, at least in the short term. And therefore, they have complex political, diplomatic, and public relations aspects, which cannot simply be ignored by announcing that all that the war is started and will tell you, or the military commanders will tell you when it's over and how it came out and what the bill is. And finally, and I think this is a difficult less again, easy to state, difficult to cope with in practice. War is a, and the use of military force is ultimately war, large or small. War is a brutal, nasty business. It not only kills people, it means to kill people. And it involves risks to our soldiers, sailmen, sailors, airmen, and Marines that we cannot expect. And as a matter of historical record, the United States did not expect in the Balkan context uh, to have a risk-free war. It, it is a blessing that there were no direct combat casualties among the American or NATO forces in, in the Kosovo War. That is not what we expected. Almost all of our allies who participated in UNPROFOR had people killed in the course of that conflict. Uh, I lost three very good friends, civilians, uh, one, one an Air Force officer, all in a, in a, in a civilian military capacity. This was, this was not an example of America expecting cost-free war, and we cannot expect those in the future. Uh, I think we have left, in this as frankly in a number of other areas, we have left a good legacy uh, on which the new, new administration can build, although I certainly agree the challenges are, are formidable. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. Last official act as a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Richard Pearl is a resident fellow of the American Enterprise Institute, where he has directed its commission on future defenses. He is a member of the Defense Policy Board and a consultant to the Secretary of Defense. He was Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy in both the Reagan and Bush administrations, an advisor to members of Congress, and a frequent commentator in both print and broadcast. Richard's going to reflect on the costs and benefits of U.S. involvement in Balkan security, consider perhaps a recalibration of U.S. interests, and what the implications are or are not for a redefinition of the military role in the Balkans. Richard, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, like Walt, I can't speak for the administration. <laughs> Yet. Um, nor, nor for the next administration. Um, in fact, the next administration can't yet speak for the next administration, so we are much freer than almost anyone else. Um, I was struck by uh, Walt's summary description of the, uh, the progress that has been made in bringing uh, war criminals to justice. Uh, the big fish, or some of the big fish, but really the big fish are still at large. And they are indeed. And by the way, I hope that the incoming administration will uh, summarily abandon um, all acronyms, but especially an acronym that makes it more difficult to say the word war criminal and then should say the word war criminal. Uh, the big fish are indeed still at large. The biggest of those fish is Milosevic himself. And I can't think of a more salutary development than uh, um, than the apprehension and trial of, uh, of uh, Milosevic. The apprehension and trial of Karadzic would, um, would do a lot as well. Uh, and I hope we don't slip into the view that because, uh, uh, because he left office um, the way he did, that uh, he should somehow be let, uh, let off the hook. He's a, a, a continuing uh, bad influence, and he's preventing a political catharsis of great importance, uh, as is the failure to apprehend uh, some other war criminals. So I hope that we will redouble our efforts and not consider that diplomacy somehow dictates a different course. One of the vexing problems of dealing with the Balkans uh, has been the inadequacy of traditional diplomacy. Um, diplomacy is uh, at best, a, a limited instrument, 
when dealing with thugs, it is sometimes close to irrelevant. And the essential fact about uh, uh, the Balkans has been the, uh, the management of a violent process by thugs. Um, I make the point because when we attempt to deal with thugs as though they were uh, diplomats, uh, or when we place such a high regard on the positions of power they occupy as heads of state, we sometimes forget that essential fact. Um, and because traditional diplomacy is, uh, uh, has limited effects, I believe we need to think um, about more effective ways of applying force when force uh, provides an opportunity for a solution. We have fallen into a, a pattern of regarding force uh, as a last resort. And what that inevitably means is that we go through a series of uh, endeavors prior to the use of force, because we are very often, in the end, left with no alternative. And that process, which often includes sanctions, has included sanctions uh, with respect to Yugoslavia uh, almost from the beginning, it includes sanctions uh, after ten years after the end of the Gulf War against Saddam. The, the, the process of uh, sanctions is very often ineffective, delays uh, the recognition that uh, something more significant needs to be done, and it can actually produce a situation in which force, when ultimately used, is used at a, at a much greater cost and with an unnecessarily in, inflated um, um, loss of life. Um, and of all the measures that, uh, that we need seriously to rethink um, as we look at the Balkans in the, in the future is the, uh, the, the very limited role for such traditional approaches as, uh, as, as agreements limiting, uh, limiting arms. Um, one, of the, one of the great tragedies of this century, I think, will be uh, eventually understood as should be understood even now as the embargo that prevented Bosnia from defending itself. Um, without precedent, the United Nations denying uh, a, a country under attack the means of its own defense, while failing to provide that defense uh, uh, itself. Uh, I hope that never happens again, and I hope reflection on it causes us to reconsider the the, the notion that's become popular, that restraint in, uh, uh, in the provision of arms is always better than, uh, than the alternative. The alternative might well have been um, a, a defense of a kind that proved effective uh, uh, very early in, uh, in, in the conflict, uh, where arms were available to the other side, but where there, as in Slovenia but where uh, the, there were no arms available, uh, we saw the tragic consequences. So we should be very careful about embargoes and very careful about uh, um, a failure to permit uh, beleaguered countries, particularly France, from finding the means to defend themselves. This has important implications for the role of the United States because um, while we all agree that it's best to operate with allies, I would hope that we could agree that it is best uh, to assist those who need our help in helping themselves. And it can, that in turn can, can limit uh, the involvement of the United States while potentially advancing the purpose. But I want to talk about U.S. military forces uh, in, in the region, partly because so much attention has been placed on what I think has been misunderstood as an inclination by the incoming administration to, uh, to withdraw. I think that's a, a wrong reading of what, what has been said. The conflict in the Balkans has gone through phases. Uh, in, in Bosnia, clearly there was a moment when military forces of the kind that were dispatched to Bosnia were what we needed, or more or less what we needed. They were what we had. Uh, more agile forces might have been better, but we used what we had, and we clearly needed uh, 
uh, military forces. Um, but that conflict has gone through phases, and if I take just Bosnia for the moment, it is now clear that uh, the military force that was needed at the outset is not what is needed today. We need something rather different because the, <coughs> the issues now are rather more akin to administrative issues and the police functions that have been, been referred to. And no one should mistake uh, a decision by the United States to revise its presence to reflect the way in which the conflict has changed as a, a, a fundamental reorientation of the United States in its role and responsibilities in, with respect to the rest of the world. It would be a, a great mistake to, to regard a, a rational substitution of the role we've been playing in the past to the role now required in this period of relative, uh, relative calm. As far as I know, there's been very little violence in, in Bosnia, and it's not at all clear that the United States Army is the most effective instrument uh, for the continuing role of the United States in Bosnia. And we shouldn't be prevented from a rational assumption of responsibility by a fear that we will be misunderstood as abandoning the world. There is a great danger in uh, accepting the view that we will need to be there for a very long time. And the danger is that it becomes self-fulfilling, that, uh, that we do not take and others do not take those steps uh, that will, in time, uh, permit, uh, uh, permit the region to handle its own affairs. I suppose the clearest example of, the, uh, of this may be the, the extent to which uh, the parties are able to defend themselves and protect their own interests going forward. Um, we have had a program far too small in, in, uh, in my view and um, of equipping and training the, the Bosnians, for example, so that uh, so they can defend themselves. Uh, we need to think about uh, more seriously about how we can assist um, friends in the region in providing for their own defense uh, because we will never extricate ourselves uh, as long as extrication will produce a catastrophic uh, change in the situation. So if we become the source of stability and others become dependent on us as a source of stability, it's like welfare dependence, it never ends. And so one needs transitional plans and the point is not to uh, that you leave after a certain period of time or you promise to leave after a certain period of time. Um, you can leave when the job is done and the job is done in part when you can leave safely because you have left behind um, communities that are capable of, of doing for themselves what we would otherwise be doing for them. And, and if we don't take that prospect seriously, we won't put those programs in place. We need to ask ourselves what we can do uniquely. What is it the, the United States can do that, uh, that, uh, that the Germans can't do or the British or the French? When we send an American to, uh, to the Balkans, it's, well, correct me if this is wrong, it's, uh, it's at least a year-long engagement of separation of, uh, of a young soldier from um, his or her family, and it's quite costly. <coughs> Um, a German can go home for the weekend. You can probably hitch a ride going home for the weekend, but uh, you're 45 minutes away uh, by air. Uh, it makes sense in a rational division of responsibility for the German who can go home for the weekend uh, to assume some of the responsibilities that might otherwise be assumed for the United States by American soldiers, where soldiers are necessary and for the United States to do those things that the Germans can't do or the British or the French can't do. And we are uniquely equipped, uh, unfortunately in many ways, uh, to provide uh, logistics, communications, intelligence, and uh, other um, capital intensive capabilities. And as we sit down with our European allies to discuss the way forward, it's not a matter of America shirking its responsibility. It's a matter of a more rational division of responsibility in which we do those things that we can do best and we call upon friends and allies to do the things that they can do best. And so in, in recalibrating uh, 
we should be thinking along those lines. Not to facilitate a withdrawal from the world, but to make more rational uh, the way in which we relate to our friends and allies <coughs> in a troubled part of the world, where I believe we will remain deeply involved. Anyone who expects the incoming administration to abandon uh, the, uh, the Balkans uh, has, has not paid attention to the, to the people who are putting that administration together, including the president-elect himself. Finally, let me throw out a suggestion. Uh, it's uh, not unique, but I think the time has come to uh, face it seriously. Much of the objection to the American <laughs> military presence, not only in the Balkans but elsewhere, has had to do with the role that we expect military forces to play in peacekeeping operations. And very frequently, uh, the activities associated with those peacekeeping operations are not the things for which our soldiers, sailors, and airmen have been trained. They don't reflect the missions that cause them to sign up for a career as professional uh, military people. It is a source of frustration for them and even uh, demoralization. Um, if we are going to be in the peacekeeping business, and I think inevitably we will, then it's time to consider establishing a peacekeeping institution that is not the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine Corps, that has some of the capabilities of, uh, of clearly protecting itself and even protecting others, but that is organized, uh, equipped, and trained and optimized for peacekeeping operations that are different from the combat operations for which we train and equip our troops at great expense. Um, the, the new institution would be uh, a, a good deal more content in its labor. The Department of Defense would be happily freed of a burden that it has taken on by default because it's been the only uh, the only capability at the disposal of the Commander-in-Chief. And I, I hope the new Commander-in-Chief will consider that perhaps we need a new capability that is not part of the Department of Defense, but that can play, continue to play an important uh, peacekeeping role. Thank you, Richard. We're going to try to stay on schedule, but I would like to allow uh, an opportunity for a few questions. So if you have one, if you would step up to the microphones, identify yourself, and please be brief. Oh, oh uh, do you want to say anything for the question? Mark would like to add something before the question. Uh, I want to go to this question of uh, the overall U.S. role, uh, which has been raised by Richard, uh, and particularly the military role in the Balkans. Uh, it seems to me the question here is that there remains, uh, for an unforeseen time, a number of very neurologic problems. The situation is better, but it is not complete. And we have to face those neurologic problems. And those neurologic problems may be the source of violence. Uh, now, no one is holding to any particular level of U.S. forces. They're way down already. We provide roughly 15% of the forces. What I was trying to convey was is that the, it is the overall American weight in determining what should be done that is most important. And that these things, with all due respect to my European colleagues, simply should not be left for Europeans alone to resolve. And one of my deep concerns is that, and I hope it does not happen, that the new the incoming administration will serve to organize itself so as to diminish its involvement in the decision making of the Balkans. And I think that the American military presence and its, or some American military presence, and its, uh, is important in, in negotiating with our allies what needs to be done to resolve some of these or to how to handle some of these neurologic problems. I don't think we simply can make that a burden-sharing exercise as to what U.S. forces does do. All right. Uh, start with Landrum and that question, and that will be all we have time for. 
This question <coughs> comes out of a, a kind of worm's eye view grassroots experience in the Balkans over the last five years. The question is how can we arouse sufficient public interest and support and congressional support for staying the course and doing the job that has to be done. Uh, just a month ago I was <coughs> in Bosnia and visited some of the villages that I've been acquainted with over the last several years to see what had happened about the return of refugees. There was a time in which many of the experts said these are people who will never come home. They are coming home. But they are still very, very uh, in a very precarious situation. They need more financial support if, we're going to, if they're going to be expected to really establish a, a new life there. It seems to me here is the key question that we have to address, the new administration has to address. How do we build up support for providing the funds that will need to be done, need to be made available to carry through the economic development programs that we've talked about, partially undertaken, but still have a long way to go in carrying out? Thank you. Um, who would like to answer that? Walt, you look ready. Uh, one of the most hopeful things that's been said uh, by the spokesman for the new incoming administration is, is what uh, Colin Powell said when he was nominated, which is that uh, he accepts that, that we need to make sure that the non-military instruments of uh, national influence are, are properly funded, properly resourced. He's talking specifically about the Department of State, but it's a general proposition. Uh, hopefully the new administration, which could not have a worse relationship with the Republicanly controlled Congress than ours, uh, will be more influential. Uh, but I think you, you, you hit on a, on a key point. Uh, the other thing is this is a place where I'm enthusiastic agreement with uh, Richard on the point about getting the Europeans to do what the Europeans can do better than we can. The Europeans are embarked on a mad plan to pay European taxpayers money, admittedly raised by voluntary contributions, to raise the Kursk. Uh, I would think that until every Bosnian has an adequate and every Kosovar, for that matter, every Serb and all the other refugees have an adequate meal a day, uh, the Russians might be allowed to pay the cost of their own folly on the curse. Could I simply correct one, what I'm sure, it was originally the case that we had one-year rotations, now it's basically a six-month rotation. As far as I know, uh, German soldiers do not go home uh, for the weekend. That's a, uh, both, I think, probably many of, the, many of the militaries there have various kinds of leave programs, but I don't think the Germans go home. I, I know they do not routinely go home for the weekend. German soldiers cannot in general casually walk down to the airport and buy a ticket home. All right, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry. Uh, Trudy Rubin from the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'd like to ask Mr. Abramovitz and Mr. Slocum whether you think that a new kind of peacekeepers, uh, U.S. peacekeepers light, who were not military, would have the kind of heft and um, reflect the kind of U.S. stature that would enable them to play the kind of stabilizing role that they do now. And uh, to Mr. Pearl, you said you thought that U.S. would be involved in peacekeeping under the new administration. Does that mean we can interpret the famous uh, we're not going to be 911 remark to mean sometimes but not all the time? <laughs> I would have um, I think, and in this I agree, I wouldn't call it a peacekeeping corps. I think one of the real and most serious lacks on the international security armamenture, so to speak, is the lack of essentially kind of gendarme capability, uh, which in some sense I think is what, is what Richard is, is talking about. People who are trained in some sense both as policemen and as light infantry and have some of that equipment. I, I don't, I'm not sure that's the place where the United States comparative advantage lies highest, but I think it's a basically good idea. Uh, however, as, mm -hmm. as those of you who've been there know, uh, the United States made a deliberate and I think very wise decision uh, that we are, to quote uh, Secretary Perry, at the beginning, we are going to be the meanest dog on the block. Uh, the reason the M1s are, the M1A1 tanks are there is not because we fear a, 
heavy armored assault from the republic the remnants of the Republic of Srpska army uh, but because they are in they are in fact a very good deterrent a very good intimidating factor they may not be necessary in the future but there was a good reason to go in very heavy at the beginning which I, I think Richard concedes just on, on 911 the trouble with 911 is uh, it's intended to deal oh I'm sorry what you oh, asked to come in it's intended to deal with real emergencies, and it, it, the number of frivolous calls that go to 911 is <laughs> greatly outweighs the number of real emergencies. So we need to be discriminating about uh, where there's an emergency that requires the United States and where uh, where it's unnecessary. And I think what uh, what you've seen in some of the reflections is a sense that we have been indiscriminate in the alacrity with which we've responded. And we've sometimes responded where it, uh, it, it wasn't necessary, and we were not the responder of, of choice. March, you're going to have the last word. Uh, in regard to Trudy's question, uh, uh, I think uh, one of the biggest lacuna has been shown to be the absence of, of instrumentalities of justice, of people, police force, protection of, of judiciary, all those forces uh, that are necessary to, once you've established some sense of peace, to keep uh, keep the, the entity developing. Uh, but in many cases, I don't think they can substitute for force, for real forces. Uh, a lot depends on the situation, and as long as the Kosovo, as the Kosovo issue I, I, is unresolved, I don't believe there's any possibility of building up Kosovo forces that could take care of any resurgence, which I don't expect, of Serbian forces. So the, uh, the maintenance of, of real forces, as I think, uh, remains very important and cannot be substituted by police or gendarmerie in a number of situations. In many situations, they can certainly take over some responsibility. Uh, join me in thanking my colleagues for stimulating. <laughs>